If there's one thing that I think I'm reasonably good at in competitive Pokemon, it's predicting lead matchups. Unlike most of the videos I've posted on my channel, this is something that I feel like only top level players put much effort into, which is a shame because it can very tangibly improve your gameplay as long as you have the patience for it. So first things first, the team preview. Introduced in Gen 5 with black and white, this lets both players look at their opponent's Pokemon before deciding which Pokemon they want to start the battle. In competitive singles, we refer to a lot of the different Pokemon generations as pre-team preview and post-team preview. So in the older generations, you'll see a lot of dedicated lead matchup Pokemon because you always start with the same Pokemon or even dedicated anti-lead Pokemon and so on. But uh, that's not the focus of this video. So let's say you're laddering on Pokemon Showdown or even 1v1 on Pokemon Sword and Shield singles, what have you, and you see your opponent's six. What do you do? In my experience with the game, players are likely to do different things based on their skill level. A beginning player is likely just going to lead with one of their aggressive set of sweepers and get a sweep going first thing. A slightly more advanced player might lead with their bulky stealth rocker or hazard setter off the rip and try to get a hazards ASAP. A mid-level player is most likely to lead with a Pokemon that's good at pivoting. So maybe a choice card Pokemon who can get off a fast U-turn and get a good switch into their best matchup, or maybe even a bulky Rotom looking to bolt switch. Now, if you ever watched a top player showdown live, they don't do any of this. Well, at least not without thinking about it first. Again, if you've watched their videos, you know exactly what they're likely to say. Well, looking at the matchup, uh... This skill is not sexy or flashy, but taking the time to stop and analyze how your Pokemon match up versus your opponents will drastically improve your lead matchups. That advantageous first turn can be so huge too. It can mean you get your, your rocks for free, or you get a free hit on their switch in, you know, whatever. It just starts the match's momentum completely in your favor. I said as much in my video on sacking, but even a one turn advantage can mean a lot, especially in faster paced, offensive style matchups. So it's one thing to say that they just look at their matchups and choose their best Pokemon, but you know, what does it actually mean? Well, there's no better way to explain this process than by actually showing you. So let's hop into it. Uh, for my purposes for this video, I just sent a challenge to my buddy Austin here on Pokemon Showdown uh, instead of laddering. So that way I can take my time here and explain my thought process without worrying about a time or something like that. Although when you do find yourself analyzing lead matchups in your own gameplay, don't panic when your opponent clicks that timer button right here. Uh, you get a lot of time in this game, so you really shouldn't be letting time crunch stress you out. For my purposes, of course, uh, I'm just be gapping uh, and talking and talking, so I've just asked him to pick a matchup and walk away from his computer. But I don't know what Pokemon he's going to lead with. I didn't even know he was going to bring this team. But although he did send me a message beforehand asking that I don't judge him too much for this old team, he said he hasn't had a chance to update it much since Pokemon Home came out and changed the meta, which is, you know, it's fair enough. For our purposes, it won't really matter. Uh, so let's take a look at the matchups. To do this, I'm just going to go over every one of their Pokemon versus my own and see what matchup sounds good, and then I'll make my decision based on that information afterwards. Uh, well, honestly, despite Austin's warning that this team is out of date, it still looks pretty damn threatening to me. Um, it also looks similar to a team that I saw in uh, SPL this week, or Smogon Premier League. That's kind of where the pros play. Uh, he's got a pretty classic sword and shield defensive core with these four. Conkleter has this big heavy hitter, also probably offering a bit of speed control with the scary mock punch, and of course Dragapult, who's reached nearly 40% usage on the OU ladder for the past two months. Huge threat in his own right. Uh, as for my team, nothing too radical either. Uh, I brought a Scarfed Terrakion team. It's a little bit more offensive than uh, Austin's team. I've been tooling with it for a little while, having some fun with it. Uh, but you know, again, it's not that it's not as defensive, you know, more of a bulky offense than a balance, I guess. Uh, now right out of the gates, I should also point out that before even looking at my opponent's matchups versus me, uh, he already has some likely leads. Most mid-tier level Pokemon the Showdown players love to lead with a fast U-turn like a Dragapult, or even a bulky Rotom to Volt Switch. Uh, so immediately, I'm decently worried that there's a likelihood that one of those two are gonna lead. Uh, it's also worth noting that Silas Toad and Corviknight are very popular leads in this generation. Uh, Seismitoad is very likely my opponent's stealth rocker, so maybe he'll get greedy and he'll try to get up rocks turn one. And Corviknight is sort of similar to Rotom in that he's this big bulky Pokemon that shouldn't fear too much right of the gates and he can U-turn on whatever comes in so that he can feel the best matchup possible. But let's actually get into it. For those that aren't interested in this like nitty gritty details or don't have the time to watch the whole thing uh, and watch me break it all down, here's a timestamp for when I get back into the rest of the video. I'm gonna start by looking at my opponent's team because it's his lead I want to predict, and so it's his head that I want to get into. Uh, first, he has a Corviknight. Uh, and this thing usually acts as a late game setup sweeper with bulk up or iron defense making it impossible to kill, or even more likely, it acts as a tanky pivot to take hits and defog any hazards away from the field. Personally, looking at the structure of his team, I'd suspect it's the latter. 
Uh, but I'll have to be careful until I can confirm that. Against my team, it should beat my Terrakion uh, until I can chip it down to around 50% health to kill it with a close combat. Uh, until then, it'll be able to Brave Bird me or Iron Head me with ease. So right off the bat, he has one advantageous matchup versus me. Against my Aegislash, I'd say I have a slight advantage. It's Choice Bandit, so it should be able to 2 a KO it with Shadow Claw or Close Combat. And also completely wall him if he's Iron Head or Body Press or something like that. But Brave Bird would definitely do a good chunk. Uh, it can roost off whatever hits I've got and PB stun me theoretically. So once again, I'd like to whittle it down a bit first, kind of similar to my Terrakion. But again, I'm going to give myself a slight advantage here. Next we have my Hippowdon. I'm going to call that a draw, uh, because in terms of me getting up Stealth Rocks, it can defog my rocks and drain its PP with its pressure ability. And it can't do any damage to me. This thing is max defense and HP, and it's also got Slack Off. But by the same token, my uh, Earthquake can't hit it either. So yeah, a bit of a draw. My Clefable also is at a disadvantage here because its only attacking move is Moonblast. Uh, to be fair, unless that Corbinate is Iron Head, I should be able to Wish Pass pretty freely against this guy, so I'm not super concerned. But once again, it's not a great matchup. My Mandibuzz has a minor advantage, I'd say. Uh, it's also got a lot of defense, so I'm not too scared of whatever attacks the Corbinate is dishing out. And in return, I can knock off its leftovers and you turn into something else. Uh, finally, my Hydreigon. I actually specifically included a Nasty Plot Hydreigon because I realized how weak my team is to Corviknight while I was team building. If I can get a Nasty Plot off of this guy, he will cook that bird a lot. However, for a lead matchup, it's a little bit less good, uh, as I guarantee he'd try to get off a super effective U-turn or body press. Even then, you know, I really like my uh, Hydreigon here as a lead matchup because he can get off a flamethrower, take off half of that Corviknight's health, and then he puts my Terrakion and Aegislash that I mentioned earlier in a great position to kill it. I can easily get the health back from a Fable, Wish Pass, anywho. So I'm going to give my uh, Hydreigon the advantage here. So right out of the gates, Corvette's looking like a pretty good lead for my opponent and honestly a pretty likely option. Next up for my opponent is Fable. Usually we see variants of either a defensive leftover set or an offensive life orb set. Nowadays I think it's safe to say the former is way more common, but once again I'll be careful until I can get the confirmation. And regardless of what set it's running, it should be able to smoke my Scarf Terrakion. Uh, I can't even two hit KOAO uh, Defensive Clef with Stone Edge. It's a Moonblast, he's gonna do a ton to me. This should be a bit of a running theme with this Terrakion. You know, he's he's not a great lead. Uh, he works best as a cleaner in the late game or revenge killer or what have you. He's not dishing up fast U turns like a Scarf Hydreigon or a Scarf Landorus. So he's like he's just not a great lead as a result. Now my Bandit Aegislash, on the other hand, would be a pretty hard counter to this thing, no matter what set it's running. Even with max defensive E and Ds, uh, my Iron Head is going to one-hit KO it, and even if it's a max speed Timic Fable, so he can outspeed my Aegislash, Slash, and he managed to get a uh, Flamethrower off first, it's not even going to do 50% to me. So, huge advantage for my Aegislash. Slash. Uh, my Hippowdon, sort of similar to against the Corviknight, bit of a draw. My Earthquake and his Moonblast should do similar damage, and there's a good chance we end up trading Stealth Rocks. However, if it is Life Orb, it'll definitely do a fair bit of damage, which I don't love the thought of. Uh, then, of course, is my own Clefable. This should be a bit of a draw. Once again, I suspect that my opponent brought a defensive Clefable like I did. Uh, in which case, you know, it's a complete draw. But even if he brought something offensive, I shouldn't have much to fear as my special defensive Clef is one of the better answers to that on my team. Uh, next is my Mandibuzz, which I don't love. Moonblast is super effective and should hit me pretty hard. And if Clef is toxic, that would be a big blow to my Defogger. A Life Orb Clef would hurt even more. Finally, we have the matchup versus my Hydreigon. If I can safely get a nasty plot off, I could probably dish out some really decent damage to this, but that would be supremely risky to do off the lead, so I don't love that either. Uh, I can't really risk eating a Moonblast, which is an important Pokemon, so definite advantage to Clefable. Uh, next up is Seismitoad. Uh, like I said earlier, this lead is already a strong suspicion on my part, because a lot of middle tier players will just instantly click their Stealth Rocker at lead matchup, because they want to get them up immediately. It doesn't hurt that oftentimes, uh, especially with a great defensive mon like Seismitoad, it's a really great Pokemon to lead with in a lot of situations. So even though I predicted in advance and I know it's coming, it's still not the worst lead. And looking at this matchup versus my team, it can kind of show why it's the case. Uh, well, let's get into it. So against my Terrakion, these guys are mostly very physically defensive. So Scald would destroy my Terrakion, not to mention threaten to burn uh, without taking much damage in return. The same goes for my Aegislash, who's also weak to the Toad's Earthquakes. So two terrible matchups off the gates. Uh, then versus my Hippo, I'm going to give it to the Toad again because uh, his skull can do a ton. He can burn it or he could Toxic it. He can get up Stealth Rock pretty freely. And I don't have a Toxic even on my on my uh, Hippowdon. I've got Whirlwind instead. So I can do almost nothing to threaten it back. My Clefable has an okay matchup. Uh, similar to what we talked about with his Clefable versus my Hippowdon. If we do about equal amounts of damage to each other, we can... Uh, 
We can both do our own thing, you know. Something to keep in mind when choosing a lead versus Seismitoad is that I want to deny it getting up Stealth Rocks more than I want to beat it out, right? So personally, my Clayable doesn't have Stealth Rock, uh, so I'd rather not let my opponent get them up for free. So I'm going to give him the slight advantage here. Uh, I'd probably give it a slight advantage versus my Mandibuzz too. He can't keep up rocks with my Defog, but he can Skull Burn me or Toxic me. Uh, meanwhile, knocking off the Toad's Leftovers would definitely be nice, but it's not anything groundbreaking or huge. Finally, there's the matchup versus my Hydreigon, which I actually love. Uh, again, these things rarely run much Spadef, so the Life Orb boosted Draco Meteor has a really good chance to kill from full. And honestly, he can do so little to threaten me back. I I mean, a Toxic with some, but he can do so little to threaten me back that I'd be tempted to Nasty Plot in that position, which pretty much guarantees that I get a kill to start the game unless he makes like a risky uh, prediction. So moving right along, we have the Rotom Heat. Like I said with the size of players who know a bit about the game but don't want to put the work into looking at lead matchups will often just click uh, on the Rotom without much thoughts so they can bolt switch out. This guy definitely has a good chance to show up. The vast majority of Rotom Heats in this meta are heavy duty boots so that it can frequently pivot in and out, but I also wouldn't be surprised if it was this Team Scarfer. Uh, that said, it's one of the few matchups I see where my Terrakion would completely destroy him. Uh, unless he's got a good amount of physical defense, I think my Stone Edge just kills him straight up. Uh, however, on the flip side, I don't love the matchup versus my Aegislash. Uh, if he Will-O-Wisped or overheated my Aegislash, I'd be in a really bad way. So definite advantage there to the Rotom. Uh, versus my Hippowdon is a little bit interesting, I think, because on the one hand, I'm immune to Volt Switch and can slack off on the overheats. I'd really hate to get hit by a Toxic or tricked with a Choice Scarf on turn one. So the context of the game, I think that will be a good matchup, uh, but I don't like it as an opening very much. Glove is okay. Uh, pretty much the main reason Rotom Heat is so popular this gen is because of the huge amount of Corviknights and Clefables running around. By the same token, I've got so much special defense on my Clefable that I'm not really scared of anything. And I can even scout a turn one trick with my Protect. So I'm actually going to give it the slight advantage here just because of that uh, Protect. And I can use a negative priority Teleport to pivot out to my Terrakion safely and scare it out with a Stone Edge. Um, Mandibuzz is kind of a no-brainer bad choice versus Brodom. I think he definitely just Volt Switch off the rip here. But I at least have an interesting 50-50 with my hip out on in that situation. And uh, actually, once again, I really like the Hydreigon in that situation. Just like Size of a Toad, my Draco Meter would do a lot of damage here, if not kill outright. And there's not much Rotom can do to stop me from nasty plotting. Even if he is a trick user, I can think of a lot of worse mods to carry a choice scarf than this Hydreigon. So we're through four of my opponent's six mons, and Hydreigon is emerging to be a really great option already. But we might have trouble with these last two. Uh, but for the meantime, let's look at Dragapult's matchup versus my Terrakion. Uh, Dragapult's can run a lot of sets at the moment, but I think especially bias sets are still the more common right now. Uh, before long, my Terrakion should be able to revenge kill it with a Stone Edge. He should be faster. But once again, I need to wait a bit before he really becomes threatening, and I don't want to risk him eating a Draco Meteor for now. On the flip side, my Aegislash is a really fantastic counter to this Dragapult. Show Sneak's got a great chance to kill it from full. I think, I should probably check the count, but I think it's got a great chance to kill it from full. Uh, a little bit risky as a lead matchup as a result, but I'm still going to give my Aegislash the slight edge. Um, my Hippowdon doesn't have much special defense, so it loses to Dragapult pretty cleanly. Uh, my Clef is the opposite, uh, has a ton of special defense to match its super effective uh, Moonblast, so cleanly wins this matchup. Similarly, I really like Mandibuzz here. Uh, one of the reasons I included it was so that I could have a great Shadow Ball switch in, and it'll do that happily. It can even roost off an immediate Specs Draco Meteor from Dragapult and then hit him with a knockoff in return. And then finally, we have Hydreigon. Uh, so, for the most part, this Dragapult should beat my Hydreigon cleanly. He's faster than me, Draco Meteor kills easily, you know, no question. However, this is where my team is a bit tricky. So after explaining to you throughout the whole video, we of course know that this is a slower, nasty plotting Hydreigon and a Scarf Terrakion. But if we were to see this matchup for the first time, as my opponent does, you'd probably guess something kind of opposite. So Terrakion is really not a common Scarfer, at least in my current impressions of the current meta, and Hydreigon definitely is. So if I'm my opponent playing this, I predict like a, a Bandit or a Swords Dance Terrakion here, and I'd be scared shitless of this Hydreigon outspeeding my Dragapult. So any good player, I think, would at the very least scout this out and swap to Corviknight or Clefable to be safe if this was a turn one matchup. So, you know, that's part of the fun of this team, you know? I can be, if I'm feeling really cheeky, I could lead with this Hydreigon and bluff that I'm looking for a fast U-turn or even trying to kill the Pult right off the gates with a Dark Pulse. And then when he switches out, I can Nasty Plot in his face and get a free kill out of whatever he swaps to, whether it's a Corviknight or a Clefable. 
So this is a court moot if the enemy Dragapult is Scarfed because then he would have nothing to fear, like even theoretically. But I don't know, call me crazy. Uh, I'm gonna call this a draw just for the powerful bluff option that I've got here. And now last but not least, we have the enemy Conkleter. It's important to note that uh, the vast majority of these guys are running a Flame Warp Gut Set, which burns you at the end of your turn and boosts your attack by 50%. It's a great set, but that extra turn needed for activation means it's not a great lead. So kind of like how I was predisposed to thinking that Sesmetoad was a likely lead, uh, I feel like this this Conkleter is not too likely unless he has got some really fantastic matchups across the board. So let's take a look. Uh, well, what I just said, there's no better example than Terrakion. Normally I wouldn't dream of using it against Terrakion, but without that Flame Orb activated, Lock Punch only takes about, about half of my health. And I think I, if the Calc was right, I've got a decent chance of living a Drain Punch. So now, like, don't get me wrong, this is still a definite uh, Conkleter advantage matchup. But it just goes to show how important the Flame Orb is to its firepower. Next is my Aegislash, uh, facing off against the Conkleder Earthquake. Wasn't great last month, but now this guy's got knockoff. I really, really don't like this matchup. So it doesn't help that he can eat whatever I dish out pretty comfortably. So once again, Conkleder takes that one. Next up, we've got Hippowardon. Uh, this one I'm actually going to give to Hippowardon. Uh, he can get Stealth Rocks up turn one. And once again, without that burn, Conkleder should have been hitting too hard. In fact, I bet he'd stay in that turn just so he can get it activated because it's so important to the Mon. They kind of get a free turn of rocks there. Uh, my Fable, this is a really great matchup for Clef. Normally, Guts Boosted Facade would eat my specially defensive Clef alive, but turn one, I can dish out some serious pain and I resist all of his other moves. Um, Manda Buzz, I'm actually going to be the advantage to too, surprisingly. It's tanky enough to live whatever hits or send its way turn one, and then I can actually knock off that Flame Orb so that he never gets that Flame Orb boost. So, normally, it's a rough matchup, but I love it as a lead here. And finally, the last matchup we're going to look at, Hydreigon. Another great example of why you need that Guts boost, because I think this guy actually beats him as a lead matchup. Uh, my Hydreigon should live a Mach Punch pretty comfortably and then kill it in return with a Draco Meteor. A Drain Punch would kill, uh, but it's too slow to get that off. So yeah, my Hydreigon would be super low health afterwards, but that would be a massive threat out of the way. And I can just pass a wish to it later on with Clefable's Teleport to get my Dragon back up to full. So... That was a lot of work and a lot of talking on my end, but where does that leave us? Well, if I'm my opponent, uh, there's no way in hell I'm leading Conkleder, we know that. And Dragapult had a pretty bad spread at the beginning too. He might still try to get off a cheeky, fast U-turn, because um, Fable has a pretty good spread, but if it's defensive like I suspect, it doesn't really do much for my opponent turn one. Uh, Rotom has a few decent matchups, especially if it's packing a Scarf Trick, so I, it's decently likely, I think. Uh, Sazbatoad has some amazing magic versus my team. I think he pretty much beats everyone except for my Hydreigon. All things considered, this seems an extremely likely lead, especially as a rocker. And finally, Corviknight. Nothing to get really too excited about, really, but it doesn't lose any matchups, really, except to the Hydreigon, and even then, it's got a good matchup. Uh, and it gets to show some damage with U-turn or Body Press, so I think it's, it's very likely, too. Uh, so if we take all that information into account and we condense it, we want something that can deal with these three options, the Toad, the Rotom Heat, and the Corviknight. And really there's no other choice to be made than that Hydreigon. Uh, in my opinion, he cleanly beats these three, and I even like his options versus the Conkleder if for some reason my opponent goes for it. I can even bluff a Scarf to pull off some plays versus the Dragapult, and if he leads to the Fable, which again, I, I don't see as particularly likely, uh, I've got a few really comfortable switch-ins with my Uncle Fable and Aegislash, if that does happen. Uh, so I, and I won't even lose that much momentum as a result. So without further ado, let's see what Austin picked here. And he does pull the Dragapult. Okay. Uh, that's just perfect. So now I have the choice of ripping a Meteor and killing this right at the gates. Or I can just start boosting immediately and potentially killing his Clefable or Corbin if he swaps into it. Both are really tantalizing options. And I didn't really actually predict this going in. Uh, but I think this is a really great example of how cool the process can be. Ordinarily, I wouldn't ever lead a game with my really crucial, kind of fragile setup sweeper. But now that I've gone through one by one, I can completely justify the decision I just made. And I even have a rough game plan for the first few turns, regardless of who we pulled up. And let's flip that thought on its head. If I just kind of went for the low effort lead uh, rocker or lead the game with my U-turn or Manda Buzz, well, I'd probably be in a really bad position. At best, I get a mediocre matchup that I have to swap awkwardly around for a few turns. And at worst, I can see one of my defensive tanks crippled. The last thing I want is to be playing off my back foot at turn one of this game. 
So the value of this process brings might seem minor, but um, this creates an immediate advantage that you can press and push on for the rest of the game, especially if you're playing an offensive team and that momentum is so important. Of course, at high level play, this process becomes a bit more complicated. My opponent might arrive at the same conclusion I did that my High Dragon has some great matchups and go for Clefable expecting that. And you know, yada yada, and then I could predict that, and then we could do that. And this is just, you know, at that level, everything is mind games on mind games to begin with. So I'm not gonna delve into that. But uh, I'm sure that many of you, if not most of you, are sitting there looking at how much time I did on that and thinking to yourself, well, there's no way in hell I am doing that every game. Even if I wanted to, my opponent would run at the timer every time. Let the pros do their shit. Uh, I just want to click buttons. And to everyone thinking this, I have two counterpoints. One, I was trying to explain my thought process to you, my lovely audience. Uh, if I was going through this all in my head, it'd be much quicker. If you guys ever watched Ahita Vahita and heard Blunder and CTC immediately say, oh damn, like Bishop has an amazing matchup against this guy. It's the same process. It's a skill like anything else, and once you start to get a little bit good at it, you'll get pretty fast. Which leads me to my second argument, that this process speeds up the more familiar you become with your team and with the meta. So I just stopped and said to myself, okay, you know, I worked through it and I said that Hydreigon doesn't have a good matchup versus Clefable at lead. Well, the next time that I go through that, I'm not gonna have to think it through and calculate because I already went through that thought process before. I'm just gonna see Clef and go, oh yeah, right, she beats my, my dragon, I already thought that. Uh, I run to Clef a few more times and it's just gonna become automatic. Like, boom, Hydreigon bad versus Clef. I don't even have to give it a second thought. This is why I'd recommend if you're just trying to incorporate this sort of technique into your play that you ladder with the same team for a little while. That way you reduce the amount of work you have to do. In the OU tier, there's only about 40 Pokemon at the moment. And when you consider that almost all of your games are gonna include the same oversaturated Corviknight and Clefable and Rotom and Seismitoad and Dragapult, it's a lot faster to pick up than you might expect. At the end of the day, the most important decider of skill in this game is your game knowledge. And knowing which Pokemon match up against two is the most important game knowledge I can think of. In fact, I'd say the single most important reason why you should be looking at your lead matchups is that it teaches you to look at matchups, period. Knowing how your Pokemon matchup versus your Pokemon isn't just for picking a lead matchup, it's just good to know. This lets you make informed decisions like, oh, this Pokemon has a terrible match versus my opponent. He's not going to do anything for me. I should sack him here. Or on the flip side, or damn, like my Hydreigon has got a great match versus my opponent. I've got to make sure I keep it healthy so that I can put in as much work with it as possible. Not just knowing these matchups, but being able to juggle them in your head and update them as the game goes on and your win conditions evolve might be the biggest separator between your average Pokemon player and the pros you see dominating the tournaments every season. Now I should make a late disclaimer that this is the process of a mid-level player like myself. I do not profess to be a pro and I'm sure I've already earned a slew of corrections and arguments in the comments from what I was going through the lead matchups. I was just trying to explain the process that I go through when I predict these lead matchups. The most important thing is that I'm going through a process at all. If I make these decisions based on faulty information and it bites me in the ass, well you know now I know that and I've learned that. That's a mistake I can avoid in the future. That's just how you grow. So that means that the vice versa is true too. If you're a new player and you're completely intimidated by all that information I just dropped, it's completely okay, relax. I play this game a lot and you shouldn't prematurely compare your knowledge against mine. Even if your knowledge is smaller than mine and you don't have a complete understanding of the meta, going through this process at all will still pay off in a big way, I think. And if you're new to the game and you don't even know where to start with analyzing Pokemon, don't be afraid to look up your opponent's Pokemon on Smogon Strategy Pokedex and you can also take the time to learn what leads work in most situations. And you know, I, I kind of ragged on people who do this earlier in my analysis, but if you've got a Scarf user with U-Turn or a bulky pivot like Corviknight or Rotom, those are not bad leads to just throw out when you're just getting started. And you know, if you can even just stop and look at how like, you know, those three examples I provide and look at which of those three uh, is the best against your opponent's matchups, that's already a great start. And you are probably gonna see a lot more success when you play doing so. Otherwise, after a lot of talking on my part, that's gonna do it for today's video. Uh, if you're still watching the video, thank you so much for sticking it the whole way through. I hope you learned something. Uh, if you'd like to see more of my content or want notifications of when I upload, you can subscribe to this YouTube channel or follow me on Twitter. Uh, you can also throw me a follow on Twitch to see where I sometimes get footage or ideas for some of my goofier video ideas. Uh, that's going to be it. Thanks, guys.